Welcome to the Kotke Ride Home for Friday, February 19th, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. A history of how the U.S. government started deciding what color our food is allowed to be. Could lab-grown wood disrupt the lumber industry? And The Muppet Show has been released from the Disney vaults. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. So on Tuesday, I talked about Del Monte's genetically modified pink pineapples, which, while not exactly an innovation, does feel a bit like a whole new frontier of gimmick marketing for genetically modified produce. Now, when Del Monte reached the final stage of figuring out how to grow their pink pineapples, they had to go through a lengthy approval process with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to ensure that they'd done everything above board and their pineapples would be equally safe and nutritious for consumers as normal pineapples. And some of the red tape that they had to go through has its origins in evolving regulations for modified foods that dates back to the mid-19th century and was kicked off largely by margarine, or as it was called when it was created in France, oleo margarine. Well, oleo margarine, but I imagine that is the French pronunciation. So margarine was created to be a cheaper alternative to butter both cheaper to produce and more shelf-stable. It wouldn't spoil as quickly as traditional butter. And while that should be a slam dunk for consumers, margarine faced one problem. Because it was made largely from beef tallow, it was pure white in appearance. It looked basically like a tub of lard, which, as you can imagine, people didn't find too appetizing. An interesting footnote about people's expectations that a butter-like product be yellow is that butter itself was not naturally the same color all year round. It fluctuates seasonally. Quoting the Smithsonian, butter actually assumes a rich yellow color in early and midsummer and pale yellow in autumn and winter due partly to cow's feed. End quote. Nonetheless, the white margarine wasn't working, so pretty quickly after it was introduced in the 1860s, manufacturers had the idea to simply dye the margarine yellow so that it would look more like butter. And it worked. Margarine sales took off, eventually overtaking sales of butter in the U.S. But naturally, dairy farmers weren't so happy about this. In fact, the dairy industry basically revolted, launching a full-on propaganda campaign against margarine, making false and misleading claims about factory conditions and the ingredients in the margarine. This all built up to the 1886 passage of the Oleomargarine Act, which added a two-cent tax per pound on margarine, whether it was colored or not. As Cheddar notes, this was one of the first times that an industry pursued government intervention to try to stop competition. But that wasn't enough for some in the dairy industry. They kept pushing at the state level, and by the end of the 19th century, 26 states had enacted anti-color laws prohibiting the coloring and dyeing of margarine. Or at least dyeing it yellow, because weirdly, some of them, Vermont, New Hampshire, and South Dakota, required margarine to be colored pink in order to put off consumers. And then in 1902, the federal government upped the ante by adding a 10 cent tax per pound on artificially dyed margarine, although at the time they also reduced the tax on uncolored margarine from two cents to a quarter of a cent. But margarine manufacturers fought back too. Some increased the use of vegetable oil as a natural dye to give the margarine a yellow hue. Others started selling capsules filled with a yellow dye, or color berries as one 1940s ad called them, that consumers would burst inside a bag of margarine and knead it around before opening. The Smithsonian says that this was a normal mid-century chore in many American households. But finally, by 1950, Congress repealed the Margarine Act and relaxed their standards on the dyeing of margarine. That's not to say standards were relaxed for dyeing food across the board, however. Rewinding all the way back to 1906, when Congress enacted the Food and Drugs Act, which actually led to the creation of the Food and Drug Administration, and this began to mandate that any artificial coloring be marked on labels so consumers could know what they were putting in their bodies. 
This was partly to try to root out products that were trying to swindle consumers, maybe trying to look like a product that they weren't, but honestly, most consumers didn't really seem to care at the time. You know, at least for a bit. By the 1930s, there had been enough cases of food and toiletry items causing illnesses and accidents that the government started getting stricter about regulations for additives. You know, whereas at the turn of the century it was mostly about appearance, now it was also a matter of health and safety. But despite the ever-growing list of regulations, a ton of our foods still have dyes in them to make them look more appealing. And I'm not just talking about things like Pop-Tarts, Jell-O, and that green ketchup that Heinz kept trying to make a thing in the early 2000s. Most pickles have yellow five dye to help them retain a bright hue as they sit on shelves. Oranges, which are naturally green in some warmer climates, are dyed by some farms so that they have their familiar orange color. And farm-raised salmon, which is fed on pellets as opposed to a salmon's natural pigment-inducing diet of krill and shrimp, is naturally gray, so it has to be dyed orangey-pink to look like the salmon we expect it to. The U.S. Department of Agriculture still has certain grades for categorizing fruits and vegetables. These are U.S. Number 1, U.S. Fancy, and U.S. Extra Fancy. An example, quoting the Smithsonian, for apples of red varieties, 50 to 60% of the surface needs to be covered with a good shade of solid red in order to be categorized as U.S. Extra Fancy. The exact percentage depends on the variety. The colors presented to consumers' eyes are no longer the full spectrum that nature would offer, but rather the narrower range specified by government standards." End quote. But part of why that narrower range exists is because study after study proves consumers have certain expectations and don't find foods appetizing when they veer too far from those expectations. The most famous of those studies took place in the 1970s when subjects were fed a meal of steak and fries in the dark. Halfway through the meal, the lights were turned on to reveal that the steak had been dyed blue and the fries had been dyed green. Subjects were sick and promptly lost their appetites. If you want to learn more about that particular study and the history of dyed foods, the podcast Decoder Ring from Slate did an episode on it at the end of last year that I really recommend, link in the show notes. And it's worth noting that as people become more aware of and careful about ingredients in their food and various labor and environmental practices, more and more brands are switching to natural dyes, things like turmeric and beets. And maybe kind of seem to be slowly easing consumers out of the expectation of dyed foods altogether. And hey, maybe more companies will take a leaf out of Del Monte's book and use genetic modifications to grow certain foods in the consumer expected colors rather than depending on various dyes. A team of researchers from MIT have grown a wood-like plant in a lab that they're hoping, if scaled up, could shake up the lumber industry, drastically reducing its environmental footprint. So apart from the whole cutting down trees thing, our use of wood isn't great for the environment in a number of other ways as well. Ways that could potentially be solved with lab-grown supplies. So by just growing what would be used for lumber, the excess waste of things like bark and leaves is reduced. There's no need for pesticides, and crucially, instead of only being able to grow in places with the right climate and arable land, it could be grown essentially anywhere, and that would cut down significantly on the transportation. Ashley Beckwith, the lead author of the new study that was recently published in the Journal of Cleaner Production, said, quote, The hope is that if this becomes a developed process for producing plant materials, you could alleviate some of the pressures on our agricultural lands. And with those reduced pressures, hopefully we can allow more spaces to remain wild and more forests to remain in place. End quote. But how does lab-grown wood work? Quoting Wired, Growing plant tissues in the lab starts with cells, not seeds. The researchers extracted live cells from the leaves of a young Zinnia elegans, a species chosen because it grows quickly and has been well studied in regard to cell differentiation, the process by which cells change from one type to another. Placed in a nutrient broth culture, the cells reproduced before being transferred to a gel for further development. The cells are suspended within this gel scaffold, and over time, they grow and develop to fill out the scaffold volume and also transform into the cell types we're interested in, Beckwith says. 
The scaffold contains nutrients and hormones to sustain cell growth, meaning the plant-based material develops passively, no sunlight or soil necessary. Yet a concoction of plant cells and gel won't turn into anything very useful without some tinkering. So the researchers tested how manipulating the gel medium's hormone concentrations, pH, and initial cell density, among other variables, influenced development and could affect the properties of the resulting plant tissues. To achieve a wood-like material, the researchers had to prompt the plant cells to differentiate into vascular cell types, which transport water and minerals and make up woody tissue. As the cells developed, they formed a thickened secondary cell wall reinforced with lignin, a polymer lending firmness, becoming more rigid. Using fluorescence microscopy to analyze the cultures, the researchers could observe which cells were becoming lignified, or turning into wood, and also evaluate their enlargement and elongation. Once it was time to print them, heating and then 3D bioprinting the gel allowed the resulting material to take almost any shape after it cooled and solidified." End quote. That resulting material, though, isn't big or strong enough to be used for building projects. It's just a few centimeters big, only a proof of concept right now. Future experiments will toy with other species that would be better suited for actual construction. And maybe one day, not just raw materials for construction, but fully formed furniture. Imagine a 3D printed desk, but not 3D printed with the plastic fibers of a home 3D printer. It would be made of actual, or well, lab-grown wood. That's a possible future the researchers envision, anyways. But for now, they think we should start with those raw materials, which, as you might expect, would not come cheap to begin with. Over time, however, they expect the cost would go down since the lab-grown method could reduce the need for costly harvesting, milling, processing, and transportation. There are even more possibilities beyond just lab-grown wood, though. Quoting again, This early work with printable organics might even provide insights into one day creating advanced materials and devices that use living cells to attain temperature response or self-healing capabilities, says Jeffrey Bornstein, a study co-author and group leader at the Charles Stark Draper Laboratory. In plants, living cells can sense stimuli and respond to changes in their environment, a potentially transformative ability if it could be integrated into materials. A material that can either grow or respond to the environment or heal itself would have great power, Bornstein says. The fact that they're built out of living cells makes this possible in ways that would have been extremely complicated before. End quote. Bioprinting plant cells and tweaking them opens a whole world of possibility. But Wired warns it still needs to be monitored critically. Just because it could save trees doesn't mean it would necessarily be a net positive. Wired gives the example of lab-grown meat, which, of course, seems great for the environment, but, quote, "...swapping methane emissions from cattle for the carbon dioxide emissions from the electricity needed to run meat culturing facilities is an uncertain trade-off." End quote. And like all early experiments, time will tell if it's even scalable or if it would work in other species. It's definitely cool. But don't go designing your lab-grown wood bedroom set just yet. Alright, one last thing before I go, and honestly, this is the most important thing that I have to share with you today, this whole week even, because today is the big day. It's time to play the music. It's time to light the lights. It's time to meet the Muppets on all five seasons of The Muppet Show streaming on Disney Plus tonight. We're talking about the original Muppet Show from the 1970s with guests like Elton John, Sylvester Stallone, Bernadette Peters, Julie Andrews, Harry Belafonte, Johnny Cash, Diana Ross, Liberace, and so many more. All getting goofy with the Muppets in a kind of proto-Saturday Night Live fever dream. The Muppet Show is awesome, and two of the seasons that dropped today, seasons four and five, haven't been available in any legal form since they left syndication decades ago. Disney Plus is also including some songs that were previously cut for licensing reasons, even from the seasons that did get released on home video, and the Disney Plus versions include two extra minutes per episode that have previously only been shown in the United Kingdom, where their commercial breaks were shorter and the show needed something to fill the time. 
So today is a big day for Muppet fans, and if you haven't watched the original Muppet show before, I really do recommend checking it out. I mean, it's the Muppets in their top form, and it's also fascinating to go back and see a lot of the legendary celebrities at the start of their careers or in their prime. So check it out on Disney Plus if you can, or get the DVDs of the first few seasons from your local library. io9 has a good listicle of the top 20 episodes to check out if you need a starter guide, And also, this year is the 10th anniversary of the supremely weird OK Go music video collaboration with The Muppets, featuring a cover of The Muppets Show theme song, so I'm throwing that in the show notes for you as well. Well, that is it for this week. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I am no joke gonna go spend all weekend watching The Muppet Show. I hope you have a great weekend as well, and I will talk to you again on Monday.